fellow Bushmasters. This is Semi Indestructible, brought to you in partnership with the Wild Times podcast, sponsored by Adventure Beast, the animated wildlife comedy now streaming on Netflix all around the world and starring your favorite Tasmanian half bison. Uh, welcome to the show. We've got a fun show for you today. First, we'll do some housekeeping. Um, the two big questions from the last episode with DeLuca were where can we see Fear Island Fortress of the Bears? and tell us the story of how you jumped out of a plane to avoid a fart. So uh, the answer to the first question is pretty simple. Um, you can watch Fear Island Fortress of the Bears on Animal Planet Go on Discovery Plus uh, for free if you've already subscribed to those services. And, of course, you can buy or rent the show on Apple iTunes, Amazon, Video, I think Vudu, and a bunch of others, like 2 or $3. It's, it's money well spent if you like uh, large, uh, pungent men, and even larger and more pungent Alaskan coastal brown bears. So the fart jumping story I have told on the Wild Time podcast a long time ago before it was famous, and it goes like this. When I was a young paratrooper, I was actually afraid of heights. True, afraid of heights. I, uh, I remember wetting my pants absolutely when I was a kid. But I still loved thrilling things, and I loved doing the dangerous things, but it was a challenge for me to overcome. I wanted that beret and those wings so badly that I was prepared to do anything to get there. So when I realized I had a problem with heights, I took steps to get better at it, you know, better at ignoring the, 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 the crippling fear so I could be a more competent paratrooper. And don't get me wrong. I got through jump school just fine, uh, got through selection just fine. But when I got out of the plane, I was essentially a, a paratrooping robot, and I was just following the drills. And I, I realized that I had no memory. When I hit the ground, I had no memory of how uh, I actually got there in terms of step by step. I was just doing drills. And I wanted to increase my awareness, and I wanted to reduce the, uh, the mental fatigue and the physical fatigue of being afraid and stressed. So I took up skydiving. And I joined uh, the Airborne Forces Skydiving Club at the Naval Air Base in Nara, Australia. And, um, and so I used to go jumping there whenever I could. I didn't get a lot of leave, but whenever I got a couple of days, I would go down and go jumping. But I would always go on my birthday. That was a ritual that I had up until about seven knee surgeries ago. And so it was one of those weekends, and we had a long weekend, a, a super long weekend, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday all overlapping my birthday. And I was there with one of my close friends, a couple of close friends, and it was just crappy conditions. It was just rain and high wind and heavy cloud. And we'd get all rigged up and we'd sit on the drop zone and then there'd be a no drop. They wouldn't allow anybody to go up or, or, or even if they went up, they couldn't get out of the plane. And so we started going out the, at night. It's like, well, to hell with it. We'll go and have a few thousand beers and a steak and we'll come back tomorrow. And this went on and went on and the conditions weren't getting better, but it's right on the coast. So you never know when it's it's going to change. It, it's it's incredibly changeable. Um, and so, the night before our last night, we just thought it's got to be it's got to be good tomorrow. Maybe we should go to bed early. And then we thought if we go to bed early and we still don't get out, we'll feel like losers. But if we go out and then the next day we do get out of the plane, we'll be legends. So we went with Plan B, which was regrettable. And the next day we were absolutely ruined. And um, just beer soaked, uh, you know, just beer soaked sponges flopping on the drop zone, huge hangovers, feeling sick. And we had so much junk food, our guts were just in constant turmoil. Anyway, there was a small aperture in the cloud, and we got on that plane, just a small plane. I think it was a mid sized Cessna with the seats ripped out. And we were just a couple of big guys, it's three of us, were squished in there. And the pilot, and it was just crowded. And oh my God, I'm not going to blame anyone in particular because we were all responsible for this sort of flatulent terrorism, but just the most horrific, horrific beer farts, um, hangover farts. I mean, they're just, I mean, the air became this sort of viscous material. You could physically part it, you could see the granulation of the small fecal particles dancing in front of your eyes. It was just horrendous. Anyway, we get up there, we get to somewhere between 10 and 12,000 feet, and we're just, I just like, open the door, open the door. I'm going to vomit everywhere. Some guys were vomiting. We got to get out. And they went to open the door, and the cloud aperture closed, 
and they called no drop. The safety officer said no drop. And I just said, no, no, I'm getting out. I'm, I'm getting out. And um, the pilot, who was actually a military pilot, and just moonlighting on the weekend to get some hours in a different aircraft, he said to me, he said, look, I can use ILS and Doppler to put us right over the antenna farm. Now, the antenna farm is a huge military array of all manner of communications, antennas, um, and met data. And I almost landed on one out of a parachute on an operation in the Northern Territory. Um, so I was kind of terrified of them because, you know, it's just, uh, you know, uh, aluminum, you know, 20 feet aluminum enema. It's not ideal. And keep in mind that this is a naval air station. So you have tons of naval aircraft there, particularly the Sea King uh, helicopters and the Seahawks. I mean, this is not that long before that. We had a bad drop that got carried over into um, into the taxiway where a number of these uh, naval helicopters had started up and that do emergency shutdown to stop the blades turning the paratroopers, you know, into cold cuts. And when you do an emergency shutdown on a big helicopter, it just destroys the gears, I'm told. Um, I don't know. I don't fly aircraft. I just jump out of them. Point being, I was anxious about this. But when he said he'd get me over the antenna farm, I knew where that was. And I said, fine. And people were just ripping out these huge, huge lager bombs, these crazy atomic farts. And that was it. So he told me they were over the antenna. And everyone's like, don't do it. It's illegal. It's dangerous. And I just, I just went. I just opened the door. I went out head first. And it was glorious for about two seconds. And then I was inside this giant storm cloud. And it was thrilling. I was a little bit scared. Um, it's not pitch black, but it's a very, very dark gray. And, of course, it's wet. It's not raining inside the cloud, but the moisture is so great. You get these rain streaks coming across your goggles. And you lose all sense of up and down unless you look at your goggles and see uh, which way the water is running on your goggles because up and down, left and right are all exactly the same color. There's no gradation from light to dark, which normally helps you with your orientation. Uh, and then I popped out, I think, at just on 2,000 feet. I know I only had a couple of feet, a couple of hundred feet to get into the saddle. Um, and I did think there was a chance I was going to lose my APF license uh, for jumping in a storm cloud. Um, but when I got out, I, was, I didn't lose my license, but I was punished because the rain, uh, and these high-speed zero-porosity canopies, just the rain hitting you in the face. And it wasn't ice. It was just water. It was absolutely stinging. And when I landed, I was always kind of red and puffy. Um, so it was – but it was a memorable experience. Uh, I'm glad I did it. I have done it once since just to get a better sense for it. But one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. And the, poor, and the other guys who didn't come out, they were stuck in there, and they had to uh, marinate um, in that fart plane all the way down, took another 25 minutes. So no regrets. Um, I would do it again tomorrow. Um, if someone farts in my study, I'm going to jump out the window. That's my policy now. Hey, guys, if you're enjoying... Whoops. Okay. Guys, if you like The Wild Times, check us out on Patreon. We put out four extra podcasts per month. That's one commute a week that you're just going to be laughing and learning the whole time in the car. <laughs> hey, let me do, do something else. This is the late night content. The stuff that we, we can't show on, on YouTube because they'll kick us off YouTube. It's the Cinemax of podcasts. <laughs> Uncensored, raw dog. It's the Cinemax of podcasts. Check it out. Link right here. Um, but enough about fart. Let's, uh, let's lift the tone. We got a great episode today. We're going to talk about space. We're going to talk about biomimicry and behind the scenes from uh, my series, Little Giants on Animal Planet with a man who knows me better than he probably should. I'd like to uh, introduce my very good friend. Uh, we jokingly refer to him as my baby brother, but he is my right-hand man, uh, Billy Armand. He has a degree in architecture, a master's degree in biomimicry. He was my co-star on Little Giants. He was Mr. Science, and he's awesome in the field, and he loves the field. He's done survival training in a number of different ecosystems. Uh, he's the only uh, astrobiofuturist on the planet. Um, I want him to come on and explain what that means. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Bushmasters, this is Billy Armand. Welcome, mate. Mate. There he is. <laughs> 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 Uh, I, I can only imagine stuff going through your head hearing that story about that aircraft because we'll get to it later. But the stuff that we've been through 
you know, there are times when just things go wrong and you just got to do the thing that makes no sense to anyone but you. I, you know, it's funny out of all of that story, I'm not surprised by you jumping out of a plane over something as gaseous as farts that that that's well within your character (laughs) (laughs) but what what that story reminded me of was you talking about your fear of heights Mm. and it took me back to us being in a tree looking for uh, what were we looking for in south africa i want to say South Africa. Are you talking about the, uh, oh God, we did a lot of South Africa. Are you talking about the rock monitor? It it might've been the, the rock that, monitor. That, that massive lizard or something else. What are you talking no. about? I'm I'm thinking of when we lost an ax. Oh we no, shooting. that was in Mexico. That was in the Yucatan that's in the right. thorn forest. And, and you, that's little spiny tailed iguana. Yes. And, and, uh, oh man, what a comedy of errors. And I yeah. was using my beautiful Grunforce, uh, axe as a step. So I slammed in the side of the tree. That didn't go very well. And then step up that and get into the tree. And there was such unseasonal weather because of the, I don't know whether it's the La Nina or the whatever one, El Nino, but it was so, I mean, it is a dry forest. People don't realize they go to the Yucatan on holidays or they go what's that place that everyone goes there to, to get drunk and vomit when they're a teenager it's it's uh, uh, uh not can cancun yeah cancun that, so yeah, cancun yeah, yeah. is a couple of hours north and people are there or they're down the coast at these beautiful resorts and they don't realize that they are literally one hour from one of the unique ecosystems in the world this dry thorny forest and anyway we lost my beautiful axe and we spent hours looking for it and never found it well and that's that's only part of that right okay. because the other part was us being in that tree oh bleeding everywhere yeah and then i think that's i want to say that's the first thing that you fell out of when we were <laughs> filming <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't but it was one of the good ones it was one of the good ones <laughs> ah, ah, ah. i think that's when you landed on your hip that that one time right no, that, that's okay now time. okay now you're thinking of the other side of mexico and that was for the giant um uh horned lizard which is only about a foot long yeah and i jumped over that bush yeah. so the, the, with the spine tail so mexico was not good to me um the spiny tailed iguana, I fell out from only about eight feet and landed on my guts and kind of, and I got uh-huh. so winded, I kind of puked a little bit on yep. camera and uh, which should to play it off, but it's very hard to play off just a random puking. And then, because I was just totally winded. But the one in uh, Nichipas, that was the one where I jumped over what I thought was a small elastic shrub to yep. get this. And yep. it wasn't that elastic and it kind of bent and then catapulted me up and I landed on my left hip. Yep on a baseball size stone that was yep. almost perfectly spherical and it fractured my hip in two places. And that was episode two of 20 in, in three continents. And I didn't realize it was fractured. I just thought I pulled the muscle. And I remember saying to you when we were releasing that animal after you finished your test and I'm like, I can't, I can't kneel down. Uh-huh. Can we do the release standing up, stand up with me. So we look, so I don't look bad. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> <laughs> you did because I I was in agony. It wasn't, and I honestly thought I just damaged a uh, muscle or tendon. I thought a soft tissue. It wasn't until I got back with an X-ray, and the uh, the orthopedic uh, doctor goes, "Oh look, you fractured your pelvis in two places. That must have hurt." I'm mean, correct. It did, but um, I don't know. In yeah. that context, there's something uh, there's something good about not knowing. Because had I known it was fractured, I may not have done the other. 18 episodes you but I didn't you know. took a lot for the team thank you filming. well we both you, did i think we both did i think everyone was um we as we used to joke on camera uh, off camera all the time high and low high, high, and, low. And, low, high yeah. and low it's like yeah get to be on tv downside is you're gonna break some bones and shit your pants a few times yeah and everything's gonna bite you yep. everything is gonna bite you um i want to come back to that in a minute but i want to I want to talk about space. You and I share a passion for space exploration. We both uh, want to be astronauts and space, uh, you know, star voyages. Um, Both come at it from different points of view. I'd even tell you the story of how I got into the Russian space program back in the day. Um, No, like it's, it's funny, like out of all the things that we've, we've ever talked about, space is probably the least of the topics that we've talked about 
in all the time that we spent together, which is kind of you know what you know why that is crazy. It's a very hard topic to bring up and not be a complete dick. <laughs> like you can't. It just sounds like a pickup line, and, <laughs> doesn't it? It's like never turn the time that I was went to space. It just, it's just, it's just one of those things oh, man. that unless it comes up naturally in conversation, it's impossible to bring it up. Because it's associated with so many elitist things, uh, yeah. incredible academic brilliance and physical endurance. If you went and and discipline, if you went through the pure astronaut yeah. thing, and usually they've got PhDs in engineering and a bunch of other things. And there's some guy who was a Navy SEAL and a Harvard doctor, and now he's an astronaut. I mean, that's where the yeah. Yeah. so there's that. It's like, oh wow, so you're Superman now. And then there's the other side where it's the playground of billionaires. So you know, yeah. guys. So it's like there's no sort of every man's story to be said except mine and i will tell you that one now so i grew up like a lot of young kids wanting to go to space but in australia we didn't have any kind of space program Mm -hmm. if you wanted to to touch the moon you had to climb a a blue gum and and hope for the best we had nothing and we would pay third-party vendors to put our little our little uh, satellites onto other people's rockets and you know, and I would get up and watch all the launches and uh, like everybody got very excited about it. I'm a, I'm a little bit older than than Billy. You know, I'm I'm in my early 50s now. So I've seen a lot of space launches and and it was still very romantic. You know, I think a lot of people don't care anymore. Um, but I was of an age. I was a, still a kid in the 70s. So these these men and women were heroes to me. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, I was told by a friend who worked in the travel business that there was a way to get into, and I tried to get into the U S program. They said, hell no. Um, but I had had some success selling books in Russia and I sponsored, uh, the Kamchatkan brown bear conservation program. So I had some connections and long story short, I had a chance to get onto the Russian cosmonaut program and I had to pay my way, you know, and I agreed to do the training and make an assessment of whether I could raise the money through other means to do an actual space mission on the International Space Station, and which was like a lot, like $30 million. And um, so we structured this deal where I took all these publishing advances to do the training. And if I didn't do the mission, I would give it back. And I would, um, and then these are the TV deals and so forth. So I was about to go through this commercial program. And then one of my lawyers married a Ukrainian woman who's very lovely and her father was ex uh, ex uh, KGB guy who'd retired somewhere in Kamchatka, and he had connections. And he said, "Oh, I can do that cheaper, and I'll just hook you up." I and definitely he, heard this story. Yeah, he hooked us up with some very charismatic and dodgy operators. <laughs> um, and uh, the American commercial outfit, which I won't name, was quite well known at the time super dodgy as well and they were really pissed off i didn't go through them and uh <laughs> they since got in trouble for selling a lunar orbit mission that they never had access to <laughs> <laughs> but that's the kind of crowd that operates in this realm right <laughs> now this wasn't i wasn't the first guy to do this you know dennis tito had already gone up uh, some guy from south africa had gone up um lance bass i, I forget which band he was with is it in sync boys um, oh yeah 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 yeah, didn't he? he oh, excuse that me. Blue Origin that he grew up with, or, or no? It was pre Blue Origin. <laughs> yeah, and he was trying to get up in the Russian one. He was That's trying to go right. to the space station, That's and right. I saw his. I'm trying to find a photo. I found his his uh, his flight suit, and it's just the cotton overalls, not the actual all on suit. And uh, you know, he's a much fitter, slimmer, more cheek bony kind of guy than me. I couldn't fit into it. Um, but it's like putting on my daughter's jeans. But it, I saw it there. Um, so I, I, anyway, I get over there and I start, and so I, and I train like a dog, you know, and I'm a big unit. You, you know me, I'm a big guy, ex rugby player. And so I had to lose a ton of weight. The maximum load bearing for the, uh, the seat suspension in the Sawyer's module is I think 220 pounds. Uh-huh. It's only a hundred kilos. Uh-huh. And at the time, and I was in good shape, but I still weighed 130 kilos. So a lot more than that. Mm-hmm. So I, and I had just, and this is a bizarre thing. I got the notification that I was greenlit to come and do the training when I was in Antarctica doing something else that was cool. And I was super excited. And then the next day 
I slipped in a snow drift and twisted and tore my uh, knee. Like tore, I did a full knee reconstruction. So I had three months to come back from a full knee reconstruction. Um, and I did three hours in the, in the, in the gym every day. And I got down to about 230 pounds, which wasn't quite enough, but it was within the safety parameters. Like I could continue the training. Uh-huh. The point is at the time that I went through, I was the largest and heaviest and broadest primate to ever be put into a spacecraft. And so that's, that's a mark in history. It is. It is. <laughs> and people, people who are taller than me have gone since, but no one broader or heavier. And so I was breaking all of these records in training, which is never a good thing when space is a premium. And, you know, we're talking a million dollars per, per cubic inch to launch. Yeah. So, and so I breaking the, 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 the well, lung well, volume. Well, that's a primate. There it is. Anyway, so I got into the training and it was, it was incredible. And, um, you know, I would describe it as majestic mm-hmm. and for me, just thrilling. But in real terms, it's a, it's a lot of vomiting into helmets, uh, a lot of that. And I had the same mission psychiatrist as Yuri Gagarin, oh, you know, wow. the, f- the first man in space. I had his mission psychiatrist. He's older now. He's insane. He's absolutely insane. We do these exercises with this number association to see how you handle pressure, and you do it one way. Then they reverse it so all the numbers are backwards and start screaming at you, and they're timing you to see if you can do it just as good backwards while everyone like everyone in the room is just screaming at you. And uh, we had a couple of mishaps. Um, one was that I was in the world's largest centrifuge. I remember I'm there with a bunch of international people as Americans uh-huh. because, sadly, since Challenger, there were no – uh, U.S. launches for a long time. That's right. Since the, since the Challenger disaster, so, there, so at least there was someone I could talk to who spoke English. There were there were Europeans, there were Americans, there were Japanese. A lot of us there. Anyway, it was very cool. But I remember being in the centrifuge, and this thing's monumental. It's the size, of the length of a tennis court, and it's the biggest mm-hmm. in the world. And you can put two guys in it, mm-hmm. and it's a it's a sphere within a sphere. They bolt you in. They look like Hannibal Lecter, you know, in Silence of the Lambs, going to prison. They bolt you in, and then it can spin in any direction. And pilots, Air Force fighter pilots do six Gs. Cosmonauts have to do 12. And you do it 12 uh, inverted and backwards. I remember one time the mechanism broke and just started spinning against the uh, direction of flow. I don't know what the Gs got to, but I felt like someone had hit me in the head with a meat mallet. And, oh, this is just the, this is just the nausea <laughs> training. This is just the, you have to rock back and forth and spin. This is inside the centrifuge when it's wow. breaking and I am just floating this is me without any oxygens being sucked out of the room to be the equivalent of uh, of 30, 40,000 feet. And this is being put into the centrifuge and it going nuts. Now, when I got out of that, they unbolted me. I could not even crawl in a straight line. Mm. I was so meat axed. And then the funny thing was they wouldn't. Oh, that's, wow. So this is. Cool. Yeah, so this is the full 100% mock-up of the space station underwater, and it's real deep for the all-on suit training. But the funny thing is, and you'll see this in this video if they show it, my width from the clavicle and shoulders was several inches wider than the interior of this metal composite suit. So I had to dislocate my left shoulder every day Uh to get into it and get out of it. And that's one of the reasons why my shoulder has been rebuilt three times but it was just absolute, you know, incredible experience. One of the things that used to make me laugh, though, is there was it was never any humor or any. Um, uh, I saw you, Kyle. Fuck off. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> when when it, there was never any humor uh, or empathy, you know. And I remember even when things went wrong. And I'm I'm vomiting. I'm dizzy because the because the centrifuge system broke down. Like there was a genuine mechanical failure, and made me feel incredibly ill. Like I'd been tumble dried or thrown down the stairs. They didn't say, "Hey, I'm sorry. How are you feeling?" They said, "They said, okay, we will reschedule for tomorrow." <laughs> and <laughs> and and they never asked how you're doing. They'd always just say, "We read the data." And my favorite one was I was and I was shooting this on a little handy cam, trying to make a little documentary at the time. And this woman was doing ultrasound measurements of all of my internal organs to make sure there was no distortions or scar tissue. 
that under extreme pressure might explode, right? Wow. And and so this is an interesting concept, right? People are interested in this. So I said to her, and she's just saying nothing. And she's wearing a big white coat and she's got a big beehive do and big glasses and she's not saying anything. And so I said, uh, we get to the end of it and, and uh, it's a big screen. You see the organs being measured. She's making notes. And finally I say, look, um, so what are the results, doctor? You know, is it uh, anything I should be concerned about? Um, you know, do I pass? Is everything okay? Is there a problem? Uh-huh. And she looks at me and she goes, eh, big man, big bowels. And big that was bowels? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, I got through. <laughs> I, uh, I passed. I did my training. The middle certificate on the back there is my diploma. Uh, That's awesome. very, one of the great things to do, particularly now that Russia is a no-go place, many other cool stories, but I didn't get selected for a launch. I didn't find the $30 million. I haven't gone to space. I haven't seen the view from heaven. And based on my skydiving stories in Fat Phil Cessna's and otherwise, if there is a God up there, he doesn't want me any near, any near, anywhere near him. So, you know, that's my space story, but I know you share that same passion and, space has been one of your life callings, including with uh, your studies in biomimicry. Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny. Like, I think your story lines up a lot with, like, the why for me of why space is interesting. And it's it's all the human – it's all the human factors that are the reality of space that most people don't think about. Like, most yeah. people – space is this exotic – you know, idea, but the reality mm. of it, it's, it's super boring. It's, you know, it could be super depressing if you're on a space, you know, if you're in a, like you said, a 10 can yeah, shooting at like, you know, 17,000 miles or whatever, mm. Mm. or let's say you're going to Mars on a seven to eight month trip, depending on when you leave. Right. Yeah. All you have to see, if you were to look out a window is just pure dark, just pitch black. Mm. Right. And then what, you know, the, the things that I always find funny is like at some point during that period of time, you're going to remember that you are drinking the filtered pee of the people that you are traveling yeah. with. And if like at some point you snap, you're going to have that in the back of your mind. And <laughs> like, it's those it's those things that people don't think about with space that I, I find like from the human experience level. Mm. super interesting but for me the 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 appeal of space has always been like the the technology spin-offs and like mm. the benefit of exploring space to me is you know what are the things that in the process of trying to reach for the stars we invent that make the human experience on earth that much better and mm. i think a lot of it was just you know really kind of triggered by you know Lieutenant Worf and Star Trek. Like, I think that was my first real touch point with space. He is the big Klingon guy. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Would is this a is this a black thing? Would you not have liked him if he wasn't like seven foot tall and, and huge? And oh, cool? it's totally a black thing. I it's respect totally, that. I respect yeah. you, you. We have these conversations. Billy and I are on different teams as regards Marvel, and I hate superheroes with a passion. And uh, <laughs> he makes me go to these movies. And I'm just and 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 I know there was this huge thrilling roar of thank God when they had some proper black superheroes like Black Panther or whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, from the international point of view, they're all still fucking American. Okay, they're all American. <laughs> when are you gonna have an Aussie superhero who isn't a complete knob like the <laughs> like the guy with the boomerang in DC? And there are so yeah. many issues with a little white guy running around with a boomerang. I don't even want to go into it. But <laughs> um, but I you know what. That's true, though. The, the connection between science fiction and science exploration, they feed into each other in a really beautiful way. And, uh, you know, creativity is a big part of it. But as you say, a lot of it is the grind. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is the grind. I'll tell you something not a lot of people know. You will, because you're a, a hardcore space nerd. A lot of people see these shots of, of weightlessness and make the mistake of thinking that there's no mass. And there is. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when you're doing the underwater training, they get to, to simulate zero gravity. Yes, you have a little bit of water resistance, but you're moving pretty slow. So you don't really feel it. Um, but when you're doing that, 
you're a big guy like me, and at that time, as skinny as I could get, and I was so scared of because you can't once you you're actually screwed and bolted into your 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 uh, your EVA suit, your extravehicular mm-hmm. activity suit, or the all on suit as it's called. You're screwed into it. It's bolted shut. You have no control about getting in or out. It's a hundred percent done by other people, and they even have this kind of little crane that pulls you out because you're just a limp rag. Now you would sweat pounds of sweat mm-hmm. over the course of a, a day of training, <clears throat> and I was and the, and you can't touch your face. You can't touch any part of your person inside. Once you're in, you're in, and there's this big, uh, you know, spherical lens that kind of distorts things, makes you feel a little bit seasick, and they all you have are these two raised rubbery foam nodules, excuse me, these two rubbery foam nodules, and you can put your nose on them and blow in order to relieve pressure in your ears. Oh, okay. And, yeah, meanwhile, you're carrying your entire life support system, all your oxygen, and then you have a water cooler, water heater in the back to keep your body, and you have these rubber tubes running through your suit with full of this heated or cooled water. It's incredibly heavy, and I think it was something like 350 pounds. So you got 350 pounds on your body, plus your body, which in my case is is like 230 at that time now, <clears throat> a little bit more. And um, so you're talking almost five, you know, talking 500 pounds of mass. And yes, it's weightless. I don't have to push myself up or whatever to move. Uh, sorry, to, to hold myself up. It's, I'm just sitting there, almost with zero zero buoyancy. But if I have to turn or pull myself to something, yeah. I, yeah. I'm moving those hundreds of pounds and stopping them. Mass, force, momentum, all these things exist. And it is an incredible workout and obviously super uncomfortable. So yeah. the grind is very real and you have so many layers and hinges in your glove and so many redundant failure systems, uh, you know, uh, so much redundancy built into everything. It's so thick. You're like the Pillsbury Doughboy, but you're on the clock and you got to get your mission. My mission was to put an antenna on one of the modules and so i'd rehearse getting out of the door which is like basically exiting a a metal vagina i just didn't want to let go trying to get out this giant i'm banging on the sides it's just the worst and and then i get out and you know you got to have two fixed point on the on the spacecraft at all times you got these clips in your hands and and because i was the biggest cosmonaut in history to that point I had the wingspan so I could put a clip here around my hand along and, and do extra. So I'd finish my mission in terms of getting around it, even being conservative much faster. But actually attaching the antenna mm. was tricky. And I'm not a technician, so I didn't have all the super cool tools. I was going to ask you about that part. Like They, what- they have magnetized self-turning screws on the actual facility. So you put this thing, it's almost like a... It's like the the tap on a on a on a faucet, uh-huh. and you just put it on. You get it in, let go, and it turns itself. And That's it was awesome. And then you just got to check it, so you can't be fumbling because you can hardly feel it. You uh-huh. know these gloves are so thick. I mean, you've ever worn oven gloves to take a pie out of the oven, and then eat the whole thing by yourself in shame. <laughs> if you've ever done that, imagine having five oven gloves. And just like, you just not, do I have the pie? Don't I have the pie? Uh, it's high risk stuff and it's hard to tell. But I just grind. It's grind sweat. And you comment before about the boredom and so forth. A lot of it is just misery and sweat and isolation. And it's, it correlates exactly to a lot of my military training. And you've heard the old story, you know, um, you know, combat uh, and serving in these combat units. It's 99% boredom, 1% pure terror. And that's, I think there's a lot of that in space. The risks are so high. That if you think about them, you're kind of paralyzed. Yeah, I mean that that sound like just the the 500 plus pounds turning left and right sounds exhausting. You add in that you're sweating inside of this thing, mm. and you're you're sealed in, right? Like so a you're, coffin. Like you're a just tomb. smelling yourself while you're while you're trying to move knowing mm-hmm. that your oxygen is depleting as you mm-hmm. like it's just a lot going on that makes it, I, I i find the romanticism around space just as interesting yeah as, like the reality of how unromantic it actually is these are billion dollar plumbers a, a lot of them you know and it's uh that's kind of and I kind of wonder, you get these these men and women with such extraordinary backgrounds and capabilities, 
But really, you don't necessarily need that. You just need the kind of minds that can take the boredom to study those subjects and be cool about it and find, uh, you know, delight in this the astonishing mundane. I mean, you look at every astronaut that comes back and they want to show you their slides. I'm like, dude, you took one of these every time you circled the Earth every 90 seconds. What are you doing? Yeah. It's like <laughs> you, you have to be able to look forward to coming back to a particular landmark every 90 seconds. Otherwise, yeah. I, yeah. I can't even watch a rerun of my favorite shows. Yeah. Um, anyway, I mean, and some of the stuff, I mean, my God, the toilet. Most of the generation who listens to this show are younger and better looking than us, but they didn't live in the area of the old classic cradle phones. The 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 actual toilet, the shitter, is a is basically a telephone, uh, one for the for the uh, service entrance and one for the front door. You pee into one and you crap in the other and you put it back on the hook. There's no potty. Yeah. It's, it's, there's no gravity to suck the turds out of you. You've got to have a vacuum. So it's a yeah. vacuum powered telephone handle in your uh, in your groin and your butt. Um, and as I said, I, I was so tall for an or a cosmonaut that um, I had basically one inch of clearance <laughs> inside the. So so <laughs> if I wanted to be comfortable, I had to float sideways <laughs> because otherwise, <laughs> any kind of <laughs> any kind of slight movement and i'm just a flesh ping pong ball just bounce floor head floor head and uh you know they're sleeping bumps you just velcro yourself to the wall and some of the rations that they gave you got to test your rations and choose your ration pack uh -huh. but i can tell you in reverse you eat rations in the field when you're hungry and everything tastes pretty good so what you eat those, yeah but at home it tastes like crap so it's very hard to get excited about this stuff what what is what's the, probably the one thing that you were like actually this, this one part of this experience is like really cool. Hey, Brosters, thank you for being loyal subscribers. We appreciate everything that you do. And now we have a membership offer for you. I think you can get ad-free episodes, I heard. That's pretty big. Ad-free is big, but you can also get your comments looked at so we don't have to sift through the millions. How do you do that? Sure. Is there some sort of badge system? There's a badge system, <laughs> a loyalty badge. Boom. Shows up next to your name in the comments. Boom. We read the comment. All this badge talks. Make, I'm going to the badge store. He's going to You're get a badge. badger. He's going he's gonna to buy one. Didn't earn it. He's going to buy one. He did a fake leave. <laughs> well, I assumed Kyle would know to cut so. on the motion. <laughs> All right, let's cut now. That's that's our ad. I mean, I mean, there's so many, but the one, the thing that actually that thrilled me the most was just walking onto the campus at Star City. Mm. So, you know, Roscosmos Energia, the Yuga Garin Space Training Center, it's in Moscow Oblast, about a, about an hour and a half out of Moscow proper. Mm -hmm. And this is where space travel began. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of patriotic whitewashing that would tell you that the Americans were one, you know, created the space race. No, no. Mm -hmm. They won the race, but they didn't start it. Oh, and yeah. and the yeah. Russians yeah, the Russians already had a plaque on the moon. They had a vehicle on the moon made of silver. You can see a. Uh, <coughs> I'm I'm sorry, I'm still recovering from a chest infection. Last week, I sounded like I deep throated a pineapple. So my apologies if I still sound a little bit shaky. Um, but you can go to a museum. There's a space museum in in Moscow, and see you know because whenever you make something for space, and it's the same. We I I live about. 40 minutes from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. I mean, so you on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. And whenever they build something for space, they usually build two or three of them for testing and training. And then they they park the redundant ones into a museum. And so you can go there and see all this stuff. You can see all the Sputniks, you know, the first satellite in space. You can see this beautiful silver wire or platinum wire vehicle they put on the moon, remote control. They put a plaque on the moon. Um and the only reason, uh, so I just say, so two things on that. First is, you know, when when Neil Armstrong stood on the moon, he crushed the dreams of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the and the space program just stopped because there was no glory for them in being second, and it was worse if they if they went up there and failed, mm -hmm. and so it just stopped. So it's kind of like a giant time capsule, and this all this this sort of monuments to a far more heroic age. And just being there with the first human being in space, where they came from. Mm. When I when I was finished my training, I got to stay on the base in what they call, unfortunately named the Prophylactorium, 
which is <laughs> <laughs> which is where you go after you come back from space and it's like their most comfortable suite. But of course, it's built for like five foot six, you know, space monkeys. And yeah. I am, you know, a six and a half foot space gorilla. So it didn't <laughs> it didn't work like that. Ground gorilla. And it was it was yeah, <laughs> you know, I yeah, from Madagascar would tell that story. But it was it was crazy. So but just being there, and there was this block of flats where the families lived. And um, Yuri Gagarin's wife still lives there. And they put this giant 20-foot concrete statue of her husband out the front. So in front of her picture, we know she looks out at her dad's husband every day. Now, their life is a whole, you know, their relationship. I mean, he his worst injury other than being killed when he a drunk fighter pilot smashed into him, taunting him when he was flying, except for his death, his fiery death. His worst industry, in, injury was jumping out of a second-story window to escape his wife while he was having an affair and cracking his skull. So I don't know what she thinks looking at her dead husband every day, but it was just being there was kind of like a scene in Lord of the Rings, but for space nerds, uh-huh. it was this forgotten heroic age, and you were walking in the footsteps of the men and women that dragged us uh, to closer to the stars. So that, to me... Cool. That's cool. That, to me, was the big thing, was just being there and what gave me hope particularly at that time not now obviously the russian invasion of ukraine is you know really soured yeah everything to do with russia even though it's really the the fault of one man and his inner circle and not the russian people who i have great admiration for and love my time with them but what gave me great hope then when the entire global space industry was launching out of russia and training at uh, at roscosmos and launching uh um in the in the US in the in Russia was how everyone working together towards the common goal makes the impossible possible. And mm-hmm. that's that mm-hmm. was where you saw it happen in real time. Yeah. So I think I think that was the that was the coolest thing was to be part of that. And I'll and I'll treasure it. You know, I'm obviously there's an itch to be scratched for both of us about getting the launch, but just to be part of that, I mean, I don't know if I get down to 220 pounds now, but I would love to do that. But I mean, that was the that was the big thing that was absolutely monumentally cool. That is cool. That's that's cool. I I mean, I I enjoy hearing, you know, we because we we've talked maybe once or twice about like your your experience in the in the training program. Mm. And I enjoy hearing about it. I like just the the centrifuge oh, that's yeah. like just knowing that that's that part of it is a requirement is enough for me to know like traveling is not where i'm gonna wind up you know in in this in my space journey that's not gonna be <laughs> part of the experience uh but i think it's like for me it's just been you know again like a lot of the technology stuff right like the oh sure you, you, know, don't th- you don't think we could drug you like those 13 boys in the cave in Thailand? We can't get you. <laughs> <laughs> get you in a- <laughs> That's the thing. Like, I'm, I, I feel like when I, when I saw you, when I saw that video, that's the one part where I'm like, I would have to rethink it. I, I, still, I still feel like there's one trip to the moon in me, mm, mm, right? Mm. Um, or one trip. You know, just uh, uh, orbiting Earth in me, like just an up and down, for sure. But not like a long duration, like you know. Even the moon feels a little too far. Like I think the view of Earth, like I want to check that box, but yeah, you know, long duration trip. I no, no. I like, I look. I I hear you. I mean, I don't. You you remember this? So when I was in the military towards the end, well, even towards the end in college. And I had this middle ear infection and I was given these fairly heavy antibiotics. It was going around and I got this. And I remember just standing on parade one morning and everything just, I just suddenly, everything went yellow, mm-hmm. like vivid yellow. And I just drenched in sweat from my head to my socks, you know? Yeah. I started wobbling and my mates either side of me, my, you know, luckily did the right thing and just closed up ranks to hold me still with their shoulders. And I didn't, you know, fall down and get a face full of concrete. Um, a lot of guys smashed their jaws and faces passing out on parade. I'm like, this is not like me. Had this really serious, uh, you know, ear infection. I was given all these antibiotics, but a couple of days later, we went on this major 
test exercise that determines where you get to go after you graduate mm -hmm. and no food or sleep for five days. And they strip search you to make sure you're not got any secret, you know, any energy pills or <laughs> you're not smuggling uh, Twinkies. Yeah, no, you couldn't. You couldn't. Uh, I remember one guy put two candy bars in between his butt cheeks. <laughs> And it's just like, dude, dude, we were going to check there. <laughs> oh, my and, God. Um, you know, and, and uh, they took crazy. away my antibiotics. And I remember I, uh, the ear infection got worse. And I remember falling down at night and having to pull up a handful of grass. These are the mountains of New Zealand. And drop it to see which way it went so I knew how to stand up. And wow. that left me with some residual damage. So I didn't used to get seasick before, but now I do. So I'm like you. I found the spinning stuff and the flippity doodle stuff, just nauseating. Absolutely. That's the whole point. And you know what? That's not even the worst part. Every veteran astronaut and cosmonaut that I saw and spoke to, because we shared a combined mess hall, we would have uh, you know breakfast, lunch, and dinner together virtually every day. And I tried to meet as many as I could. And um, every single guy, and it was all men at that time, and they said, the worst thing is the first two weeks in space. Mm, that's so, I've, that. Yes. I've heard that too. It's like, like from, a, uh, from, you know, awful. even, even, you know, um, on some of these recent missions, uh, there was a, I remember hearing, I can't remember who it was, but an astronaut talk about most astronauts puke when they, you know, when they arrive in space because they're still disoriented and, and it could be, they can feel that way for weeks. This can be yeah. doing the whole mission. I've heard women compare it to, you know, second trimester morning sickness, Ugh. like this uncontrollable, unpredictable nausea. But this one's associated with discombobulation and your body yeah. and your brain just can't. I mean, and that sounds like hell. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I just want to be clear that the two things that come out of this to me really are, first of all, you know, obviously how grateful I am to have had the opportunity, but how much of it is just a simple grunt work. Yeah. Of executing your outrageous plans yeah. and you dream it, you know, as I often say, dream, think, do you dream it up, you think it through how to do it and then you execute it. And all of a sudden you've done a thing you never imagined you could. So I think it's not something from science fiction. You can do these things if you just do the basic grunt work. And the other thing is, you know, and yeah, I got some brownie points cause I'd already done a bunch of like special forces type stuff and paratrooper stuff. So they were like, okay, he's, he'll be cool, mm -hmm. but I wasn't cool. I got through it. And I was puking and and fear fighting and sweating. You know, I was sweating like a rapist in church, like a nun on a nude beach. I mean, I was just sweating through a lot of this stuff. And then I had to go home, get the calories, get to sleep. I had a heart monitor on the time. I wasn't even prepared. I wasn't even, uh, I was too afraid to think dirty thoughts in case my heart monitor <laughs> went off and I would get kicked out of the program. And then the next day I'd go in for like the all on suit stuff and the, the ISS tank. I, I, I would just eat uh, two bananas. That's all I would eat all day for fear of vomiting in my helmet and choking on my own vomit. Oh, that man. was so I don't want to make it sound like I was too cool for, for school to use a, a, an expression that is not cool for school. Um, I, I want to it was it was a grind. It was hard, but it was glorious beyond words. And, and that what, is what that's what stays with me after the fact. That's that's the other I think you know the technology piece aside like the space psychology right is is i think the other thing that's really kind of pulled me into these kinds of explorations because our bodies our brains our eyes everything about our physiology and psychology is still hardwired based on our experience living in forests for you mm -hmm. know, 99% of our existence as homo sapiens, right? Yeah, yeah. So to to have, you know, there's that, you know, they do that calendar where they're like, you know, at, you know, minute now is like the last. Oh, yeah, yeah, or whatever, yeah. Right. Like, we've only been exploring space. We've only been sending human beings into outer orbit in the last. 50, 50 to 70 years now, right? Of our entire existence. Basically, <laughs> yeah. It's been, it's been uh, 65 years, basically. 65 years. So it's crazy to think that we're like well-adjusted for all the, the mm. psychological, just the psychological, you know, um, changes alone 
uh, of being in space, let alone like living on another planet. Like the psychology that the, the psychology you had to have to get through that program mm-hmm. versus the psychology someone's going to need to have to live millions of miles away from where they grew up. Yes. Right. And have no point of reference for, you know, seeing an orange yellowish sky every day or, you yeah. know, wh- you know, whatever, depending on where you are. Different styles like, at night, it's, different, different, no gravity or different gravity, no landmarks, no, no predictable or different uh, schedule for light night and day. I mean, I mean, and that's the thing, because we want to evolve to be able to see everything uh, within reach. And I use the word reach loosely, but this is the, this is what they say. They say that one of the reasons we never have alien encounters is that no civilization has ever lived long enough to travel to another planet. And that's, what's so yeah. heartbreaking when you see stuff that's going on in the world right now, yeah. Yeah. including Russia or the USSR is the godfather of space exploration. They set the benchmark. It actually told me why they didn't go for lunar landing. I don't know if you've heard this story, but the same guys, the Yuri Gagarin psych, was saying that the rockets that um, the rockets that they were building, they said were better than the Americans. Everything was better. They were well ahead. They were overconfident, and and but what they everything they could do better. What they couldn't do was work out the math to get the lunar landing module off the moon and back to the mothership. They couldn't oh. get the math to work. And I asked them how they felt when they saw Neil Armstrong stand on the moon. And they surprised me. The answer is we felt really sad. Mm. We, we felt, we felt, and then I thought, oh, because, you know, you got beaten by the Americans. And they said, no, we felt sad because we felt that for a nation's propaganda, they had sent uh, three good men to their death. Because mm. they believed that they, there's no way the math could work to get the lunar lander back onto the onto the return module and and they couldn't make the math work and they were so convinced you know Karlov and all those guys were so convinced that they had everything mastered but they couldn't build a lunar la- a landing module that was light enough but had enough fuel to get them back onto the to the landing module and the return module and i just thought wow what a mindset they, so they said we just thought we we're watching three good men go to their death mm-hmm. and they were so shocked and amazed and delighted mm-hmm. when it worked and then, of course, when they came back to Earth, the propaganda kicked off in the Cold War. They just they just knew that they were never going to get funding again during their lifetime, and they didn't. Mm, um, yeah. But it was fascinating. Speaking of, of epic, uh, epic voyages, but with a far less glorious finale, we got to get back to the joke you made earlier that no one else but me got. <laughs> he called me Le Grand Gorille, and he's saying in French, "The big gorilla." And we were in we were in uh, Madagascar <laughs> filming Little Giants. If you want to watch Little Giants again. You can go to Animal Planet uh, Go or Discovery Plus and watch this series. It was a great series, and we it went was. around the world. It is. We got all these little critters uh, with remarkable abilities. We captured them. Billy set up these ingenious tests, and we tested them without harming them and then released them back into the wild. And then we showed how that pound for pound, what they could accomplish was so much more impressive than some of the great beasts that we're all aware of, you know, bears, tigers, elephants, rhinos, whatever. But – we were in a old, glorious, rather magnificent, but somewhat tumble down hotel in Madagascar. Our first night, we were exhausted. We've flown in. And the next morning, they had this little breakfast buffet, and I'm starving. And I'm just shoving down, you know, plates of eggs and whatever else they had going. And, of course, in Madagascar, they speak two languages, native Malagasy and French. And this guy didn't realize that I spoke a little French. And so he's saying, you know, <laughs> He's saying in French, you know, look at the look at the big gorilla. I'm like, <laughs> in French, I'm like, oh, I'm the big gorilla? And he's just like, oh, oh. Because yeah, <laughs> the, the Malagasy people are African, but their ethnicity roots, their ethnic roots go back to Southeast Asia, and uh, which is a long story all on its own. But they look very different to a lot of the indigenous people of mainland Africa because of their Asian roots. They're very slight and petite. So someone like us, we took like two giant linebackers, um, we, we stood out. Anyway... Well, I, well, I, he he didn't just say it, right? Like yeah. he also like had a gesture. Yeah, he did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Bastard. Uh, anyway, I regret nothing. But I got to ask you, mate. What are some of the behind the scenes highlights and lowlights from that epic twenty episode international production that that, that still make you laugh? Because there's a know, lot that just get me going. We had we had so many 
different things. Like, like you said, some of it wasn't even involving animals, right? Mm -hmm. Like some of it was in transit. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, when we were in, we were in some airport and it it gets like that, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like this group of people just came up. Oh, the Chinese tourists. Yeah. 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 That was in, that was in uh, Johannesburg. That's no, right. no, no. Was it Johannesburg? No, no. I think we were on our way to Thailand. We were. In, we were. I gotta say, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense in Johannesburg because you wouldn't have been the only black guy. Yeah. No. Right. No. We were. I. We were in some airport in between places. Yeah. 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 And this might have. Like, yeah. Hilarious. Of, yeah. Chinese tourists came up and just started taking photos. Like I was just in line. We were just in line, and like they just started snapping away. And like you, they thought you, they a... thought you were somebody very famous, <laughs> and then and then the the camera assistant uh, uh, CJ DJ AKA Smoke because he just vanishes <laughs> whenever you ask him to do something, he's gone. As it's like people go, hey, we will take five minute break, we'll see you back, gone. And then he found the best party in the world and, and just tell you all about it. So <laughs> CJ and I pretended that we were your bodyguards yeah. and you were a celebrity. I was thinking on that, and I was thinking because you didn't have the baby beard going then. You were you were clean shaven. I wonder who they thought you were. I that's the thing. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I have two suggestions. Uh huh. You might have because remember you look freaking huge. But you're in great shape anyway. But you look freaking huge compared to them. I wonder if they thought you were Bob Sapp. Bob Sapp, the former football player slash MMA fighter who's based in Japan. Uh-huh. Check, I want if that was a possibility. And then here's the other one that's even more flattering, LL Cool J. (laughs) (laughs) But they they fully thought, because they see CJ's a big guy, I'm a big guy, and they see us around you, and I think they fully thought that you were a celebrity being protected. It was very funny. My my favorite part of that whole thing was like, like, you know, they just start snapping, like not even asking. They're just like snapping. No. And then the minute I'm like, okay. You got to pose with me. Yeah, right? you and did. They would, <laughs> <laughs> they would come oh up and like God. pose. <laughs> Some of my favorite stuff is stuff that didn't even make it to the series. Yeah. Uh, and one yeah. of the ones that still makes me laugh, we were in South Africa. We're right on the border of Botswana. And we're just driving out to, I didn't even know what we were going to get. And we come across this massive rock monitor, this huge yeah. lizard. And... um like a giant goanna, very thick set, much square of face, kind of like a tree crocodile that you get in PNG, and 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 these things straight up a tree. And so we were just psyched. Let's like get so get it. So we run over there, and I'm just tripping on everything, and I'm just rolling on the ground like a clown. So I couldn't use any of that footage. We get into the tree, and they'd given us the line producer had bought these really shitty field tools and you know, like <laughs> springs and stuff. Yeah, and I was trying yeah, to get I'm this random stuff. You're trying to reach this this big lizard up in this tree. And I climbed up as far as I could without the branch snapping. And I'm trying to reach this massive lizard up in this tree. I get in with this stupid crap. It falls out at your feet. You miss it with the net. It comes straight back up. I have to get back up again. Now I've lost the stupid tool. I finally, I'm thinking, okay, it's going to take a piece out of me, but the camera's there. I got to be cool. So I grab this thing around the head, finally get it, come down. Thank God we got it. And And someone says, oh, it looks like it's you choked it out. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is what a lot of reptiles do. They play dead. He just, to make me feel that he's less desirable. He died of natural causes and he probably tastes awful. Trust me. As soon as I let him go, he's going to be fine. He's like, I'm not sure. I go, trust me. He goes, I'm not sure. I let him go. Bang. Straight up the tree. And we still haven't got the shot. Yeah. Still haven't got the shot. So we got to climb the tree again. And every time I'm thinking he's going to rip my finger off or something. And the, our guide there, Theo, has this massive scar on his arm when he tried it. So I'm like, great, now I don't look like Theo. And um, I get him down again. We get the shot. And um, and we let it go, and it bolts off. They didn't use any of I that. Know. I any know. Any of that. And oh, And because I, was... I, I remember, like, even while you were, you know, holding it, right? Like, it, mm. it's it, you could see, like, the torque from it moving, like, while you're trying so to hold much it. much muscle. Shot. So much muscle and those claws. And I'm just like, please don't. Because I've seen them tear each other up and, and get anything. I just, it's such a messy bite. I was in hospital getting my hand rebuilt when this guy came in uh, and he raised, uh, he worked at Sydney Aquarium. And his passion, though, was reptiles. And he raised these, uh, I say small goannas, but they're still pretty, you know, it's a lot of lizard. 
And one of them, he was in there getting the tendon repair in his hand because he was feeding them little bits of minced beef and it bit him. And this, and their saw like teeth, you know, jaw just ripped into him and cut the tendon in his hand. And I'm thinking, and that was like a little lace monitor. I'm thinking, if that can do that, this rock monitor could really put a hole in me. And I just didn't want A, another injury like that. And B, I didn't want the infection that is absolutely certain. I mean, his hand looked like, you know, he, he'd left a, a you know, a steak sandwich uh, under the fridge for a month and then went, oh, maybe I'll try some. It looked disgusting, you know? So, so I just didn't. Here's, here's one thing I wanted to tell you. I, I've mm. never told you this. Mm. But there were several times while we were filming that I was jealous. Of, jealous? Of your role mm. in, in while we were filming. Because you, uh. you, uh, you were the animal handler, right? Sure, like sure, you go, sure. You're the wildlife expert. So you handled all the animals. I love that. And there was some where I was like, oh, man, I'm dying to, like, have this little thing, you know, like the, 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 uh, not the flying squirrel, the. Um, oh, sugar glider? The sugar glider. Yeah. It's and, uh, you know, even, even uh, the, 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 the lemur, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. The little, the little mouse, that little yeah. thing, separ- that separated my knuckle. I mean, that little well, tiny thing. Yeah. So that's the thing. Every time that I'm like. Man, like I, I'm like anytime I was jealous, the minute I saw you get bit. <laughs> I, like, I don't think there was a single thing that didn't bite or sting me the there entire was time. You got bit by everything. 22 I know. episodes. It was so funny. 20 I just, episodes. I'm trying to think of the best. I mean, that the 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 mole rat bite yeah. was super deep. And the funny thing about that, and this is television making, is I pull this thing out of the hall and it's biting the bejesus like really big bites and billy measured the the bite force and it was huge and yeah. he, I mean, yeah, I will, i'll find a photo uh and put and put it up but it was just crazy this this uh this cape mole rat bite the, but what you don't see is i pull it out and then the director mike he goes <laughs> yeah that was angle was bad looks stupid can you do it again <laughs> i can't let it go <laughs> i just gotta hold it while it continues to bite me and put it back and pretend to do it again, which we did. But the whole time it's just biting me. And I mean, we're laughing now. We laughed as soon as the camera stopped, but it was hysterical. That was funny. People didn't realize that. I'm trying to think of the other one, the, the, the hornets, the yeah. hornets. I forget which one we would, I think that was the, uh, the Sonoran giant that was the centipede. centipede. Yeah. yeah that was which had centipede. stung me earlier in the day. And yep. that was, Epic sting, not hurt like hell. Yep. But we were getting to the end of it. We're putting it back, and Jim, the 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 the, the head cameraman, steps on this bank, and it just kind of opened up like a natural pipe, just opened, and then this gold stuff started pouring out, and then realized it's just yellow jackets, and it just they sprayed their pheromone on Jim, and they're like, oh, let's kill this guy, and we're close to him, and then I go, oh, quick, let's block up the hole before they all come out. I try to do that and fail. And now we're getting all of us get a hammer, except for you. I was there. Yeah. You had gone up for the next phase and uh-huh. you were way up on this rock. And uh, anyway, we just got absolutely destroyed. Hundreds and hundreds of stings. The only thing that saved me is I had a, a singlet, like a, like a Under Armour singlet under my shirt and it couldn't get through the shirt mm. and the under Under Armour, but everywhere else, just hundreds of stings. And I was lucky I didn't have an, any kind of allergy. But you remember they got stuck in my beard, which I grew yeah. really big for the show. And they were just stinging my face and throat, and I couldn't get them out. And I, had, I ran up to this cliff to find you, and you had to go through my beard. Because unlike bees, these any kind of wasp, uh, hornet, yellow jackets, they can keep stinging. We're trying to get these things out of my face. I just, was- remember, I just remember hearing, like, okay, we're moving now. We're moving now. And then... I, yeah, I, like I because uh who's with me? I think Trent Trent the other yeah, Trent, Trent was up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trent Babington, he's a lovely guy. And and I'm like, I'm looking around like what? And then I just see like you guys running up the hill, running flat out, and it was and very steep, very you know, steep. Everybody's yeah. like, you know, trying to I see like hands moving, and then you you bolt like you're you're you know i'm still up high yes you bolt away from the group because i i it seemed like they had started following you or something and yeah, you yeah, yeah. like just 
going ham at your face. Mm, mm. I, and then you, I come down and I finally meet you because I'm like scooting yeah, down the hill. Uh, yeah, trying to come and fix it. And then you're just like, hey, yeah, like, can you do me a favor and like just get these things that are like tearing up my face? You said something like that. I think I think that's part of the, the clip that they got. And I, you know, I still have gloves on and I'm trying yeah. to, I think it's just one, yeah, but you yeah. have like several body parts of yeah. hornets like throughout your beard because you were like pulling at trying to get them out i'm just punching like, myself in the face yeah oh yeah. my god and yeah. then just there was one that was still alive oh my and, god and still just like stinging you and i just remember like trying to like i i remember grabbing most of its body except for its head mm. and and that's yeah. fine that's yeah. a win i'll take that i mean that's the thing and i guess uh, and i was again i was in tremendous pain but luckily, I didn't have any kind of allergic reaction to that. And but I had numbness and like electric pain type pulsing through one side of my face and throat for about six months after that. Um, and also my shoulders and arms for a little bit less. But I still had this echo of pain, all this poison. It was a crazy feeling. I remember getting touched by uh, the gimpy tree or the gimpy gimpy or gimpy bush, which is probably the worst poison plant that I know of. It's in northern Australia in the tropics, and these white fiber-like hairs under these broad light green leaves, you get them on you, and it doesn't hurt you just then. You can clean it all off, and it'll hurt you for months and months afterwards. And this was like that. But poor Jim, his hands blew up like hamburgers, Ugh. and then he had to convince himself that he was allergic to steroid cream. I'm like, that <laughs> yeah. makes no sense. It's like I'm too th- I'm too thirsty to drink to drink water. I was like, what do you, what do you? And I had oh, this drill. Man. And so Bushmasters, here's a tip. I take this with me everywhere when I know I'm going to get bitten or sung, which is all the time everywhere. And what I do is I have this routine. When I get stung by something, I, I, I go back, I take ibuprofen, anti-inflammatory. I take a couple of tabs, tablets or capsules. I, um, I put some ice on the sting or the bite. And then I apply steroid cream and I drink electrolytes, you know, Gatorade or whatever. And I am usually good to go in, in, in two minutes. And even when that centipede got me, if you watched, uh, I forget his name, little guy, Cody Peterson, it looks like he got shot, yeah. you know? And, and but when I do it, it's like, we'll, we'll film within a minute. Did my routine, bang, you can go. Now I know he's trying to illustrate the dangers of these animals, little kids. And I respect that. It's actually, I'm glad that he's out there. But in the real world, when you got to suck it up and get on with it, make sure you keep that in your kit wherever you go. You can't always have a full comprehensive first aid kit, but anti-inflammatory, ibuprofen is my choice. I uh, don't care which uh, brand you use. And um, uh, steroid cream, uh, ice, cold pack, get a chemical cold pack. If you don't have that, you can live without it. Put it in cold water in a stream and Gatorade or the equivalent, and you will be if you don't have allergic reaction, you'll be good to go very quickly. The pain will ease very quickly. The next day, Jim couldn't use his hands, and they finally put some steroid cream. And within six hours, they were back to normal size. So, um, you know, he learned a valuable lesson. Uh, I, but, yeah. I actually learned a valuable lesson on that episode, too, um, because that was, that was like day three. Mm-hmm. Day three or four of us filming, like, the whole series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So that's like, you know day three or four of me filming, you know, anything. Right. So when you watch that episode, Trent was up there filming me looking for these things, but right. there's not a lot of me in that episode is especially in that moment with the hornet's nest. And I realized later it was because you remember it was like super hot. Oh, hot. And and it that, was, that, that red rock everywhere, just like an oven. Yeah. So so I was sweating, right? And the angle of the shot, like Trent was higher than me. And I'm 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 trying to get down to you, but because it's hot and I'm sweating, my my crotch <laughs> is like <laughs> Collecting all the sweat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so his shot for me is like just my back and, and like sweaty crotch. <laughs> so there's hardly any footage of me except for when I meet you. <laughs> is that <laughs> you get right? It out of your beard. 
What you're because, saying they cut you're saying they cut you from the episode because you you your crotch sweating? I didn't know like camera angles and, <laughs> and because, Oh, that's too funny. Well, you know what hurts about that the most is I obviously this ending was never planned. I mean, yeah, this yeah. this centipede, we had we caught two or three of them. They're plenty dangerous. The sting hurts like hell. I don't recommend it. I give it one star. Point is, it's plenty dangerous. And and we never planned to get stung by hornets, but it was just such an epic thing that happened at the end of the shot. It became part of the show. The Animal Planet executives went, oh, that looks fake. Did you make that up? And they literally <laughs> thought the yellow jacket uh, nest opening up and attacking us was fake because you can barely see them. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I, can, I can tell you all honestly, there were hundreds, if not thousands of hornets in the air. But when you put a wide, you know, camera that's taking in human figures these things look like angry little raisins and um anyway it made me laugh about the stuff that gets cut that never ends up there's so many things one of the stories that i will never forget it's not a, not even a story it's just a memory that's locked in my brain uh-huh. and every time i see you it's hard for me to not remember this is we were filming in i want to say we were in south africa we were we were in a cave right and you were telling me how claustrophobic you can get sometimes i'm very claustrophobic i hated the cave hated it and you didn't have you didn't have anywhere to put the whip scorpion that you had just found that we were looking for (laughs) earlier in the day (laughs) yeah i remember that and so you had to like you had to reach for something or you had to like grab something else so you put the (laughs) <laughs> get out of the lap. You, put, you put the word scorpion in your mouth. <laughs> uh, I was, was so you, awful. I you put that. this arachnid in your mouth as a as a pocket. <laughs> yeah, and you then you're like, yeah. and I just remember seeing it, and it was like the gro- because it's alive. Like you, you didn't like crunch. You weren't eating it. You were no. holding it in your That's, mouth with my lips, very gentle. And it's it's like. You know, its its legs were still moving around, and then you took it out, and and it was still like perfectly fine. But I just like that was the minute when we were filming that I knew you, you would do anything <laughs> <laughs> to make this show happen. That uh, was well, yeah, we were carrying that oh, show. We had to God. make it happen, and we couldn't find those things. I am a I am a little bit claustrophobic. I hate you were loving those caves. Yeah. You were loving it. You were having cool. the best time. I was absolutely hating it. I just I had to keep focused on the mission because I absolutely hated every second inside that cave. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I felt like it was going to collapse on me. I had a bad experience when I was a kid, and we were mucking around this little canoe in shallow water in this muddy bay, and they turned the canoe upside down, so I stuck underneath it. I have a little bit of air at the top, and they sat on it, and they were having a laugh, and then they got off it with my, my siblings and friends, and it wouldn't come up because it had vacuum sealed into the mud and I just, I couldn't move and I'm just <laughs> this little breath. And I remember just like, I'm going to die. And it was a horrible feeling. And I think that stayed with me. So I get in a cave mm. and I can do it, but also, you know, I'm, I am, as they put it out of Madagascar, a big gorilla. So I'm not meant to fit into small spaces. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a tunnel rat, yeah. but that was, so I'm focused. I was so glad to find those amblypigids. And the great thing about that of having the round rump uh, whip scorpion is there's no don't argue on the back end. And I didn't have anywhere to put it. We saw more than one. So I thought so I can do this. And a lot of a lot of beetle and insect guys put stuff in their mouth. Charles Darwin records the time he put a bombardier beetle in his mouth just to keep it while he's grabbing all the other specimens. And of course, it detonated and burned him with the. Uh, the hot blast out of its ass and uh, he spat it out. Didn't know what had happened. But so I put it in there. The highlight slash low light of that is twofold. First, <laughs> it got its spiky pedipalps up into my nose uh, and cut me right. and it started right. bleeding I and just kept about that. bleeding. And, and that led to a scientific discovery, which is they're not listed as venomous. But what we found was that they actually – uh, regurgitate their stomach acid onto their pedipalps, uh-huh. pedipalps when threatened, and then they spike it in. So technically, it is venomous. It stabs you with these acid-coated 
pre-digestive enzymes. And that's exactly what snake venom is. It's it's a pre-digestive enzyme. And uh, so that was why it hurt so much. It was bleeding like the dickens. That was the sec- But the second thing was, you know, it was an epic TV moment. We were both laughing about it later. And then Animal Planet cut it because it looked too scary, it looked too gross. I'm yeah. like, but isn't that part of the joy of doing this stuff? You know, so again, another epic thing that just didn't appear on television. And if you hadn't brought it up, I, I, I probably would have forgotten about it, you know, which is such a great shame because that was... That was a crazy moment. I felt like I was in like the movie Hellraiser and just things were just going on. The like, one thing that I think came out of that getting cut was we had some great burgers that night. That that was I think that was like was, bone was, marrow burger. Oh, that was at hop. Well, hang on. No, 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 no. It no, wasn't. No, no, no. But I know what you're talking about. Yeah. No. That was when we were doing the uh, out of. Oh the, no, you're right. Room. You're right. And yeah, we did pickups in Northern California. That burger place, the Bone Marrow. Where was that? Somewhere yeah, else. I, I can't remember, but God, it was good. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was a good night. That was a good well, night. Well, then there was no payoff for that. You just. No, no. Had just, acid, regurgitated acid in <laughs> your. Stabbed nose in my, no uh, reason. my sensitive mucosa. Yeah, no, various, various levels of suckiness. I think the memory that makes me laugh the hardest, it wasn't even that dramatic. We're in Madagascar, we're thinking this is amazing. We're on that kind of, um, I mean, it looked like a, a, a lake, but it really wasn't. It was sort of a scalloped bay, and we're down by the coast. We'd seen so many cool things that morning, and we were filming something. Uh, I forget what it was, but right on the beach, we're filming, and they're filming some other stuff, and you and I get a second to sit down for a minute. It was just hot and, and drink some water, and these massive fruit peels just kept smacking us in the head, falling out of nowhere. <laughs> and we found out, we looked up, and these massive rainforest trees, and there's some sort of wild passion fruit that's about four times the size of a regular passion fruit, and all manner of lemurs are way out there. Uh-huh. They rip these things open, take a big bite out of the flesh, and then just drop it. And it, it was just one of the most funny, beautiful things. If you're like me and you've always loved lemurs, to actually be in the land of lemurs was... Yeah amazing and yeah. and that was just us laughing our heads off and we're exhausted we're broken you know fractured pelvis we're all sunburnt we got all weird tropical rashes you got yep. crotch sweat going on which was freakish now that i know that that was um you know i remember i told my bicep just as we're getting on the plane to 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 go to southeast asia yep. so we've had so much stuff and it was such an epic trip you were such a great friend and a great uh ally throughout it was such a laugh it was such a joy Mate, it's I just I love being your friend. I love doing adventures with you. I thank you so much for being a guest on uh, Semi Indestructible. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that was you know that whole adventure was you know memories that I'll I'll have and cherish for the rest of my life. Like not only just what I learned, but just like a lot of the stuff that you know we talked about off camera and oh, yeah. you know you know, I mean us chilling in in trees in uh in thailand and then being covered in fire ants oh my god ripping yeah. that clothes off no one knew yeah. what we were doing just these yeah. two guys getting naked and the <laughs> boat's doing a long shot like what are you and we're just like screaming we got fire ants in all our clothes uh all the <laughs> we, were, we were waiting we were waiting for them to tell I know. The boom, and we're in the we're, we've pushed ourselves back into the the trees and the brush Right. And there's all these fire ants on the leaves that are now covering our body. We're literally stripping, still waiting for them to tell Actually, us. Actually, I remember now. So technically, they're red weaver ants. Absolutely excruciating. Oh. Absolutely excruciating. That was hilarious. I mean, just so many funny things. I remember how we both swore I'm never going to eat zebu ever again. <laughs> Looks like beef. Smells like beef. It's not beef. No. I mean, it is, no. but it isn't. I remember getting like, coming to the dining area late, and you'd order the last ribs. I'd have a zebu burger, and I'm like, God, I hate you, Billy. I hate you so much. <laughs> oh, it was so good. There was so many good moments. Oh. And uh, that's, that's one of the great things about this business. You get to bring friends along, and yeah. you become even deeper friends. But you experience these wonders together. And, um, you know, I, it scratched an itch for me because of all my adventures, I'd never been to the African mainland before. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I had six trips planned that all canceled, postponed for various injuries and accidents. I know you hadn't been there before. Yeah. And both of us with different perspectives, it was a really important special trip. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I remember us talking about like, 
when we when we saw just like the red clay, right? Yeah. And we, we kind of just taking it in our hands and you know, yeah, rounding ourselves and being there. And then you know, when we it. were filming, we were filming, we were trying to catch the sunrise that one time. Yeah, I don't think that made it in there either. But no, we sat there for like four hours and they got yeah. nothing. Yeah, yeah, but that and the hippo is the other you, thing. Oh man, so we were. <laughs> So, you know, I was, you want to be careful with hippo. Obviously, I'd never been in the wild with hippo, but I knew a lot about him. And we were sitting there forever being super yeah. quiet. And they're coming out on dust. A lot of people don't realize this. The hippos don't feed in the water. They come out on at, at dusk and they feed at night on on usually grasses and the vegetation growing around the river. So they So they come out of the water and we're sitting there at dusk getting eaten alive by all manner of, of insects. Mm. And we finally see this just top of the head and the, and the wiggling ears and it's coming up and Billy <laughs> gets so pumped. He like grabs me. Like he's getting me sight to go back into the game. He, and, and it just goes and back yeah. into the wall. And I was like, Oh my God, I love you, but I want to kill you right now. I'll never forget that. Like the shame, the shame, it's still it's still fresh, right? No, because man. I, I'm not so gonna... cool. But I was also I was I don't know if I told you that I was also like low key terrified because you know hippos are very temperamental. It goes it can go badly very very quickly, and they've you know and it was this is not like a track meet. This is not flat, easy to walk on ground. It's all chewed up from hippos and the mud and everything else. Um, and there is faster. a very they're yeah faster they're, than you think. They come straight out. They're galloping along, and you're yeah. stumbling over yourself. No, it was a valid fear. I was, I was, I was scared and excited too. It was, it was. You know, I don't want to ever be on the wrong side of a hip. I can tell you yeah. that for a fact. Um, okay, so next week we're talking about survival and self self uh, sustenance and and uh, food foraging and hunting with the one Forrest Galante from the Wild Times podcast. Should be fun. I'm looking forward to it, Billy, mate. You're just the best. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, Semi Indestructible is sponsored by uh, Adventure Beast, the wildlife animated comedy series now on Netflix. This is part of the Wild Times Podcast Network. Uh, just remember, uh, Bushmasters, that testicle shredding terror minus death equals adventure. Get amongst it. 